Good evening and welcome to the Woodchuck Report. My name is V Chase. I'll be standing in for Bonnie today. A little bit about, about myself. I obviously I, I am a libertarian. I was on the Libertarian Party, have been since 2012, 14, one of those two years. I have uh, run for a state representative twice now, and I more than likely will be. And so today I'm just filling in for Bonnie and well, here we go, this is the Woodchuck Report. First thing I'd like to do is just talk about, you know, the town caucus. You know, every, every election cycle we have to caucus at least 10 towns to be able to count. And so far, we have Essex Dunn, Fairfax, Westford, Shaftesbury, Roxbury, Richmond, Burlington, South Burlington, and Milton have been organized. So thank you to all those who did help organize. We appreciate it. We still have a couple of towns left to go to meet our 10 minimum, 10 minimum town minimum. So if you would like to organize your town, or if, you, if you're in Addison County, we, have, we need a couple more members for that. If you're in Addison County, please email belibertarianwithmevt at gmail.com. The person to contact is Archie Flower. So if you're in Addison County again, please email him. We, we could really appreciate you and your numbers. Also, if you'd just like to organize the town for this year and any subsequent years, please email. The, the name to email will be Jeremy Ryan. You can reach him at chair at vtlp.org. That is vtlp.org. So now that we got the town caucus things out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. So right now we have, in terms of uh, news updates, you know, we do have the drug policy that we, we need to talk about. We do have, uh, in case you, you haven't been paying attention, the new uh, U.S. Senate tax bill has come out, or at least the, uh, the outlines of it and what it's going to entail. And as well as what's going on at the Vermont airport, we do have some Second Amendment updates as well. And things to look forward to in our libertarian calendar. So first thing first, I'd like to get this out of the way since I have it right here in front of me. We can talk about the new tax bill and how it's going to, at least the Senate section, and how it's going to affect you. The most important thing I want to talk about is us, the middle class. And right now, the way it's looking as is uh, that our taxes will go up. Anyone making between 75 and 100 grand will be going up. And so uh, that's going to affect about 11% of the households as well. In fact, I can read it off to you right here since I have it in front of me. It's going to hike taxes for some Americans. And of course, there are several analyses from various groups, including the Joint Committee on Taxation, which forecasts that one in five households We'll see the bill go up within the next dec decade if the law is enacted. So by 2019, 11% of households will be making 75 to to $100,000. And actually, we have someone on the line, so let us cut to the line. Hello, you're on the Woodchuck Report. Hi, Barcelona. This is uh, Bonnie. I didn't mean to interrupt uh, you going into the tax bill. I uh, wanted to get to the other topics. If you want to... Continue talking about the tax bill. Go ahead with that. Oh, no, actually, let's, let's talk about you're on the line, so let's talk to you first. Okay. Um, I wanted to call in with a, a couple of updates here. We did talk about the Pownall situation last year, and later in the show we're expecting that Becca Dragon herself will be calling in to talk about that. She um, has been speaking up about the town plan in Pownall, and she found other liberty-minded residents from various parties who agreed with her, and she's been talking about the Empower Pownall plan, which she says is, is all about social engineering. So we're looking forward to her calling in. And then I just wanted to do a bit of a drug policy update, which we is a topic we often cover on the show here. Um, one, the, the major news, I guess, um, is that there's no news yet on the marijuana task force. Governor Phil Scott vetoed the marijuana bill passed by both houses of the Vermont legislature last year, or earlier earlier this year, um, before the legislative session ended. 
and he created a committee to focus on public health and safety issues. Its three subcommittees will focus on highway safety, education and prevention, and taxation and regulation. And their first report from that committee is due to come out on January 15th, and then they have another more comprehensive report due on December 15th of 2018. So obviously nothing much is going to get done until December 15th in terms of a regulated market, um, and we might not even see the legislature doing anything like the bill that passed last year before then either, uh, which would really be a shame because that would be after the next set of elections, and we know this legislature was interested in passing a bill that included home growing um, and, and decriminalization, even better decriminalization than Vermont has now. Um, I just wanted to, to quote a story by the Vermont Press Bureau. They talked to Jay Pershing Johnson, who was uh, Governor Phil Scott's legal counsel, saying kind of what the Woodchucks report has been saying for a year or two, that there really is no standard roadside test, which is something that the legislature and even the government a bit was holding everything up for, you know, oh, we want a saliva test that works just like an alcohol test. And now Scott's legal counsel, Jay Pershing Johnson, is saying that the DREs, the drug recognition experts that I've talked about in the past on the show, might be the only thing that's realistic to detect impairment on the road. So um, the other twist in this is that the hemp farmers in the state are now a little concerned that their recently won freedom to grow industrial hemp could be threatened. But Lieutenant Governor Dave Zuckerman, of course, is on their side, and he encourages them to contact him with their concerns so they can be addressed by the legislature. And in the hemp department, my Champlain Valley reported that the Department of Agriculture has nearly 560 acres of hemp farm registered in Vermont to various growers. So that is progress that we don't want to lose. And then one other story I wanted to bring to the attention of the viewers are is about the um, messaging going on at the Vermont airport. Um, AddictionPro.com had a good story about that. A drug testing lab in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont, and more than a dozen partner organizations have converted a high-traffic section of the Burlington International Airport into a change corridor featuring information about substance use disorders. The author of that article, Gary Enos at Addiction Pro, reported that the drug testing company says the partnering organizations, which include treatment organizations, state agencies, and the Burlington Police Department, came together to emphasize to the viewing public that substance use disorder is a brain disease and not a choice. This is basically what substance use disorder professionals um, have been saying for a long time. It's what the libertarian have been saying is that this is not this is not a crime. This is, you know, if somebody is abusing drugs, it's a problem that they need help with and throwing people in jail, taking away their ability to keep a job, things like that are not helping the problem. So I just wanted to let people know that that display is on the second floor of the North Terminal at Burlington Airport. And uh, I just wanted to welcome, welcome you to the show. I hope you enjoy doing it. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to making the show even better with, with you there and hopefully getting more people to contribute news, you know, looking for news and, and making comments on it. And so thank you. And if everybody could join us at the Woodchuck Report, let's let's get a, a good libertarian news source. And let's keep, let it let's let it go on for another decade. All right, and thank you, Bonnie. I am happy to be here. Very happy to be here. So back to what she was saying about about the drug lab testing, as she was saying. So we have various places, especially the airport. And so the next thing on my agenda would be the the new uh, the bump stock l rules that are happening. In case you haven't, you were living under a rock for however long. There was another heinous gun crime, and a guy in a hotel shot hundreds of people at a, at a concert, a concert venue. And so one of the th things I was targeting is a bump stock. For those of you who don't know, it's a bump stock. It's an attachment onto the actual stock of a, generally a rifle that allows you to pull, for each trigger, pull multiple triggers. So it's just, 
Long story short, it's designed to make a semi-automatic rifle, semi rifle operate like an automatic rifle, even though it is configured for semi-automatic. And so now the new legislations, especially uh, Massachusetts, has, is outlawing bump stocks. So anyone who is caught with a bump stock is required to dispose of it lawfully. And so obviously there are people against it. There are some people for it. And so uh, the Free State Project supporters, they're, they're pledging to move to New Hampshire from the Bay State ASAP, and also as well as various other groups. And obviously Vermont being a very free gun state, uh, our laws, well, we have no laws. So to some that is a bad thing, to many others that is, it's a good thing. I feel like we are extremely responsible people. Uh, I believe as of this year, possibly last year, according to the FBI, we are now the safest gun state in the union. We overtook New Hampshire. So I think one of the things we could be looking at is, you know, how are we different? So, I mean, we do have places like Chicago who we have a many, many people use. Chicago has some of the strictest gun laws, yet they have some of the highest gun crime rates. So th those are arguments where gun control doesn't work. And there are other arguments that Chicago isn't a prime example of that. But whatever your take on it, it's, I think, a discussion regardless needs to be happened. The end, end, the end decision, well, the end decision is the end decision. So next on my list will be the Liberty Calendar. And one of the things that we're looking up to is the 11th Annual Liberty Forum, which would take place between February 8th through the 10th. 2018 at the Radisson Hotel, which is downtown Burlington. We also have one in Manchester, New Hampshire, and all early birds tickets are available. You can go to nhlibertyforum.com, that is NH as in New Hampshire abbreviation, nhlibertyforum.com. And other events will be coming up, and as we find out more about them, more information, we will be letting you know, posting on various websites, especially the uh, Libertarian website as my phone goes off. So, if I may go back to our tax, to the new Senate taxes, and since, as we all know, things you can't cheat in life, death and taxes. So, right now, taxes is our biggest deal. And back to what we were saying, to what I was saying about, about the middle class, which is the majority of us here anyways. If you're between seventy-five hundred thousand dollars, you're most likely going to see your tax go up, and this is according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, which they forecast one in five households will see the bill go up if the law is enacted, which in by two thousand nineteen will be approximately eleven percent of the population of households. So most of those people who are seeing the house their income go up are already high income, but according to uh, some estimates like the Tax Policy Center. Uh, roughly 9% of the middle class, 20% of all the earn earners will see a tax increase as soon as 2018, which is next year, with an average about $1,000 increase. And then we have an estimate from the Penn Wharton budget model, which finds that the tax bill will shift the tax burden towards the higher earning groups, but that won't be before 2040, and possibly not if the bill raises the deficit. Now, from a libertarian's pr perspective, you know, Tax cuts are always welcome, and that is one of our models. You know, low taxes, more freedom. I personally do see some benefits in this. I would like to see a spending cut myself, since there's no point in lowering taxes if you keep raising spending. You just create a higher and higher budget deficit. So that's just economic one of one. Your income goes down, you spend more, you gotta make up that gap somehow. And so for us, we keep borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. Our tax, the deficit just hit, it's about $19.9 trillion, last I checked, which was shortly before this, and that is keep rising. So one of the things they're looking at is how the Senate plan will raise or lower the taxes for the mi middle class. Since the Senate plan, according, in relative to the House of Representatives plan, is they're both facing criticism because they're adding wider tax breaks that benefit the wealthy. Uh, in the House bill, for example, they are repealing the taxes on large inheritance and tax breaks for parents and children in private schools. 
And notably, the Senate tax plan is going to maintain the estate tax, which doubles the current exemption, effectively making it far more generous to those who have millions of dollars to pass on to the heirs. So, in conclusion, for one of the things they're talking about in scrap, one of the things that they're going to be talking about is scrapping both state and local tax deductions, which this is a part that affects Vermont since we are a high tax state, as so many of us already know. So the Senate plan is going to essentially deal a huge blow to us, the middle class. They're saying about 7.6 million households, which make between 50 and 75,000 a year in income. Oh, lost that page. Oh, sorry. So between 7.6 million households between the fi between 50 and 75 thousand dollars do take that tax de tax deduction. So if they eliminate that, that means that it's an added bill that they will have to pay. So New York University's Lily Batchelder, who was looking at this, pointed out that the H House bill versus the Senate version repeals the personal exceptions that are indexed to inflation. For those of you who don't know the basics of inflation, government prints out more money, cost of everything goes up. So if there was no printing of money, you would have 0% inflation. So in that re respects, it would be indexed to inflation, which would replace the credits that are currently in existence, which would mean that some middle class families would end up paying more taxes than they would now. Meanwhile, the Senate bill is going to leave in some of those deductions which disproportionately are used by the upper income, including the mortgage interest tax deduction, which is always a high price, high ticket item. The Senate plan will also scrap the alternative minimum tax, which generally targets high income earners because they can effectively make their tax rate lower than, for, some, for example, someone making a million dollars could have an effect tax rate that is lower than, say, someone like me not making a million dollars. So. Someone who making a million dollars might have an effective tax rate of say 15%. Meanwhile, someone who's making 35, 50, 45 thousand dollars, who might have an effective tax rate of 20, 25 percent. And so that is a very big ticket item. You might have heard Warren Buffett talk about that, how his effective tax rate is lower than his secretary, even though he makes tens of times more money than she does. So that is a big ticket, big ticket item. Now, President Trump, who reportedly owed more than $31 million in taxes as of 2005, would also be exempt with that, to use that as an, another example. So that's just some ex excerpts from the proposed plans from both the House and the Senate, and how it will and most likely will affect you. If you are concerned about it, I suggest you go online, you know, do your research, look at it, Obviously, as time comes on and all these tax bills and details come out, you're going to see them all over the news. Here, for example, the Woodchuck Report and also on your local news and any social media you, you're going to start seeing. So, for it. so for, now that we got that out of the way, things we, we need to talk about. Make sure I cover everything. Well, now that I got that major agenda out of the way, I would like to talk about me here again, since it looks like I will be replacing Bonnie. As I said, my name is uh, V Chase. I am a libertarian. I like to consider myself a classic liberal libertarian. And so some of my backgrounds is I did, I went to Essex High School, graduated, and shortly afterwards, I was lost, as most young kids are, decided they joined the, the military, went up into the Navy, spent six years of that, you know, some really good times, some really fun memories. It, it is an experience. I uh, do not recommend it for everyone. It requires, military life itself requires uh, certain, obviously, dedication. It is an obligation. It is a contractual obligation but it also requires a certain mindset that you need and need to enjoy. I had fun while I do it, I was doing it, and then for some reason it clicked in my head that I wanted to do something else. So I left, decided to come back and go to school. 
I went to UVM where I graduated uh, with a bachelor in economics and that was fun. I had uh, Professor Wolf who we have mentioned before in, in the show and uh, I was all on the track team as well. So I had fun being both active and getting an academic uh, education. And then after that, I got out, you know, joined the job force, realized a couple of things like, A, I needed more education. So for some unknown reason, I've now decided to go back and uh, get my master's, which I'm still planning on, but we shall see. Well, it looks like we do have another caller, and I'm going to interrupt myself and see who, who we have here. Good evening. You're on the Woodchuck Report. Hi. Hello. This is uh, Rebecca Dragon from Pownal. Rebecca, good. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. Great. Um, I guess. Um, uh, Bonnie said you had questions for me to get me started talking about what's been going down in Pownal. Yes, yes. Uh, one of the things, well, I wanted to uh, at least have you recap the whole situation for those who do not know, who have not been heard, you know, who have been mm -hmm. living underneath a rock, so they can at least get the quick spin right. on things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess there's a lot of things going um, down in Poundal and, and, and Vermont as a whole as well. Um, a lot of um, back and forth with state versus local control of a lot of different things. And the most recent um, thing that has happened is, you know, we have to ratify a new town plan. Um, and the state has um, created a system whereby when, when you write your new town plan, if you want to have deference at the um, – at the top, at the Mount Pillar, for instance, any kind of um, green energy siding, anything like that. Um, if you want to have deference, meaning that you get to go there and say, you know what, I really don't want this project there, you get, you, your town gets to have say. If you do that, um, you have to have all of these things, requirements written into your town plan that almost makes the deference unnecessary, if that makes sense. No, I, um, yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and so um, there's a very big in Pownal in particular, I find, a really huge philosophical divide regarding the role of government um, versus uh, the role of a local community in making decisions, um, who makes the best decisions, where is it best to have the power centralized. Um, and there's a huge movement towards um, regionalization right now, also through Act 46, um, the town plan planning, the way that's been going on. Um, as far as our town plan is concerned, um, a lot of language was, was written into the first one that was proposed that would have the potential to displace many people living in trailer parks. We have one of the largest populations of people living in trailer parks in the state. And... Um, under the guise of floodplain control, uh, they, a lot of language is written in there about literally moving people out of their homes. Um, and so many of us came and got our hackles up at the local town plan meeting and um, stood up against this and said why we were against um, having this kind of language written into the plan. And um, in the Bennington banner, eventually what happened was a, an article uh, – decrying the dangers of um, libertarianism <laughs> in relation to this town plan uh, uh, was printed in the banner. So that's how I believe um, Bonnie got uh, started reading what I was writing, because I wrote a rebuttal to that. So that's kind of what's been going on. May I ask, what, uh, what mm -hmm. were they saying about, no, when they were, you were saying they were decrying the libertarianism, what were some of their arguments? Um... Well, just that government isn't all bad. They called they called us, I believe, like paranoid and delusional. Um, those of us that didn't want so much state control that we felt control is much better um, localized, um, and um, that it's night. I think naive, misinformed. Um, they accused many of us through the town through the town plan process of spreading false information. Um, one woman had actually. Um, sent out a flyer and distributed it in the um, trailer parks. And the flyer literally only quoted the town plan. 
It didn't have commentary. It didn't, nothing. It just said, this is what is in the town plan, and here's where the meeting is, if you want to say something about it. Um, also, we started on our local front porch forum. I believe that's everywhere now in Vermont. Um, um, several people started every day putting a new quote from the town plan, no commentary. And we were accused of spreading false information. That is very and then it turned, they turned it into libertarianism. And I believe they got the libertarian quote because I, on one of these front porch forums, just said, you know, there was all this um, organization of Democrats. So I wrote on there as a response, Does, is there any organization of libertarians or Republicans? And I think they just glommed on to this libertarian statement and turned us all into libertarians, although I think I'm the only one who's officially a libertarian. Yes, that is a... Uh... That is interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. So in terms, it's certainly very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the town charter and the rewriting of it, you know, what are one of the things that uh, the town panel and uh, the oppositions and those who are for it, what are they trying to get in out of it? Well, I mean, I think there's again, there's a philosophical divide, um, and w one part of that is this idea, you know, like quote unquote safe housing. There's a very big push for wanting to build subsidized housing, um, which I believe is just one little tiny part of this grand um, idea of smart growth. Right. Um, so they're trying to implement these ideas of smart growth. They're trying to get people out of their cars, um, building bike paths, um, boosting um, more public transportation and also really controlling the way you're able to use your own land, um, uh, how you're able to develop or not develop your own property, um, preserving, quote unquote, open spaces. Um, which, you know, maybe on the outset, a lot of that sounds very good. Well, of course, there should be safe housing for people. And of course, we should protect these beautiful open spaces. But really what it is, is it's really, it's almost micromanaging to the nth degree our daily life and how we, the people of our communities, want to live in, move through, and actively develop and hold together our communities, if that makes sense. Um, and so there is this this one group of people that that have the opposition towards it that, in my mind, have definitely more of a we know better kind of big government um, trust in big government. Um, these are our ideals. These are obviously the right ones. So we need to implement all of these rules and regulations that will that will um, bring in um, our ideals and not caring or thinking about uh, that people might think or live or want to live differently. Okay, that is, well, we look forward to hearing more about it as uh, the events occur some more. I want to sure. thank you. Hopefully right now the town plan, they're, they're rewriting it based on some of our suggestions. So when I find out what changes were actually made, I'll, I'll, um, I'll update you guys, okay? All right, well, thank you. All right, thank you. Well, as a great man once said, the scariest thing you can hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So with a couple of minutes left, I'd like to wind down the show and say, well, thank you to all who is, are listening, who will be watching this in the future when they re-air it again. Uh, this is the Woodchuck Report. And obviously, and so in passing, one of the things I'd like to uh, add to you if you are interested or if you just want to know, you know what is libertarianism you know what it entails it is a very broad branch of as it was said philosophical thinking but it's also a little more than just philosophical thinking it is definitely a way of life you know the the catch-all banner of you know small government more freedoms is what we aim to provide but I think there's, there's more to that, more to it than just that. So go online. Uh, there is the National Libertarian Party you can go to. I gave you the email for our chairman, Jeremy Ryan, if you'd like to have a conversation with him. Definitely help us in our caucusing, cause, so we can at least try to end this whole two-minute, the two-party system. So in conclusion, I want to thank you again for watching the Woodchuck Report. My name is V. Chase, and, and I hope you stay tuned to the next time we have the show.